the concerns of the Holy Spirit, the concerns of the Holy Spirit. And um, hopefully you'll you remember the, the primary one we began with. When we're dealing with the concerns of the Holy Spirit, what is the primary one? What was the first one, the primary one when it comes to us? Susan. The inner man. The inner man. Let's not forget the inner man. And I must stress that and will continue to stress it because that's what God is doing in our lives. One of his concerns, his great concern, is the inner man. Number two, when we're dealing with the inner man, what is he doing? Number two, the, the what? The complete man. The complete man. Number three, the perfect man. Number four, the mature man. He wants to bring us to a maturity. Number five, he's concerned with life. Number six, he's concerned with liberty, freedom. Wants to bring freedom into our lives, setting us free. Very, very important to understand that God is bringing us to a state of freedom. So in this, we move now to our next one that God is concerned with. And this is really a big one. And it goes past where you and I are in this life. God is concerned with the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Remember what Jesus said, that all things shall be brought under the feet of Jesus. That all authority has been given unto him. He's dealing with, the Holy Spirit is dealing with, focused on the kingdom of God. I think the first place for us to look tonight is if we could turn in our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. Luke, chapter 1. Verse 33. Luke chapter 1, verse 33. <clears throat> now, over the years, uh, you just look at history and you'll realize that kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. Kingdoms come, kingdoms go. Many times, leaders have arisen and they're looking to dominate the world. And yet, in all of this, we must realize that the kingdom of God is coming and even now has already come. So when we look at Luke chapter 1, verse 33, it says this. And he will reign over the house of Jacob, how long? Forever. Long time. And of his kingdom there will be no end. When we look at verse 32, just before that, he will be great and he will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. This is the covenant that God had given David when he was king. He says, I, will, he says, I want to make you a house. David crying out and praying to God, I want to make you a, a house. And God in 2 Samuel 7 says, no, I'm going to build you a house. And he makes a covenant with him and says, basically, from your seed, I will set up a kingdom that will have no end. So at that point, everyone knew that from the, from, from the, from the uh, Hebrew people, from the Israelites, from the time of King David, 2 Samuel chapter 7, he made that covenant. He gave that promise. And he says, I will build you a house of which there will be no end. From your seed, I will set up the throne and it will last an eternal covenant. It will last forever. A rulership that will have no end. From that point, they knew that it was going to be the, that the Messiah, the anointed one, the one that had been promised down through the ages, was going to come from the seed of David. The lineage would be there. That the Messiah, meaning the Christ, meaning the anointed one, all three mean the same thing. Anointed one, Messiah, and Christ, or Christos, mean all the same thing. The anointed one. The one that's been designated to save. The one who's been specifically going to be pointed out and, and consecrated for this task. And, of course, we see in Isaiah that there is no other Savior but God. And then all of a sudden we see that down through the years, it was always going to be the lineage of David coming. The lineage of David. When all of a sudden, even in that same Luke, we find that the lineage is given of Jesus. And what, what do we see? But of course, it coming from the seed of David. Does that make sense? Does that, is that clear? So we see that the eternal kingdom promised in the days of David 
came forth, and here's Jesus. And it says immediately, right in Luke chapter 1, even as he's, he's uh, the, the promised one to come, it says immediately, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Verse 32, it says he will be great. He will be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, immediately linking him to the promise of David, the covenant of David. And in verse 31, going before that, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Jesus, of course, is the word for and the name for Savior. The one who will save God's people from death and destruction and the wrath to come. So we see this, this Jesus, this kingdom coming of which there will be no end. Now, let's turn from here to the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 7. Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 7. In Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 7, of course, Isaiah, tremendous prophet, said, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice, from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord, the fervor of the Lord of hosts will perform this, will perform this. God is establishing his kingdom and there will be no end to it. And it says the zeal of the Lord will perform this and nothing's going to thwart it. Nothing's going to frustrate it. Nothing's going to hinder it. It's coming and it will come and nothing's going to stop it from coming. The increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Verse 7a. If you go right before that, that's where the declaration is made in regards to the coming of the Lord Jesus. In verse 6, notice it says... For unto us a child is born. Of course, today we know that's Jesus that we just looked at in Luke chapter 1. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So God has been and continually has been concerned with the kingdom coming and the kingdom is Christ Jesus, and he is the king. So we oftentimes just take that for granted or just call him king without realizing that the Holy Spirit's great concern has been from the very beginning of ages, has been ushering in, establishing, bringing forth the kingdom of God. And the king is Christ Jesus, and the kingdom is found in Christ Jesus. The king is Christ Jesus, and the kingdom is found in Christ Jesus. Does that make sense? Because everything was made by him, and through him, and for him, according to Colossians. So Christ is not only the king of the kingdom, but he is the kingdom. God Almighty is the kingdom. Now, we see that it's linked to the Davidic covenant, that it is Christ Jesus, that he's, that he's concerned with the kingdom. Now let's turn to Daniel chapter 2. Just flip over a few books going forward to the prophet Daniel. In chapter 2, verse 44. In this section of scripture, Daniel has received a dream and he understands it. it's going to be the rise and fall of great kingdoms. The rise and fall of of great kingdoms. And it says here in the latter days, in verse 44 and 45, and in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Stop right there. Do you remember even in the days of Moa, Mo, uh, Moses when he threw down the staff and it turned into a king cobra? 
And then it turned on, and what did it do with the other snakes, that the staffs that were thrown down, and turned? Consumed them. Devoured them. The same thing we see here is that the kingdom of God will come, and what's it going to do with all the other kingdoms? Devour them. Consume them. There'll be nothing before him. That right now, nations rage against God. Just look around. Right? Just... Turn on the news in any news program and you're going to find immediately the na It says even in the Bible, why do the nations rage? Uh, that th as though there's no God in heaven. Is that when his kingdom, which currently is coming but is not yet known in its fullness, currently these kingdoms, we have, and we've seen them down through the ages, you've had the Napoleons, you've had the, the Hitlers, you've had the Nebuchadnezzars, you've had the, uh, the Belshazzars, you've had all of these uh, Hammurabi, you've had all of these great kings, many of them that we don't even know, that have risen up and sought world domination. But in this, God has allowed countries, and you notice almost every country has had its chance at rulership. Uh, down through history, you'll see that almost every country or every people or every tribe, to some degree, has had their opportunity for world rule. And right now, it's the United States. But before that, you can go and you see that the ones that ruled the world, whereas even Britain, where a little island had rulership, where they said the sun never sets on the British Empire. Total rulership. They had total control. Spain had their chance. France had their chance. Italy had their chance. Go Russia's had their chance. Japan even had their chance. And you just see constantly all these people in all these continents and all these areas where they had their, their rulership in the world. But there's only one, and you'll notice, all of them have risen and then what? Fallen. They, they, they didn't last. They didn't stand. The Bible is helping us to realize and know and trust. And we hear it sometimes almost to the point that we just go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Without really realizing that this kingdom shall not falter. This kingdom not only shall not falter, this kingdom does not falter. And this kingdom is coming and this kingdom is already now being seen and manifested and the devil tries to thwart it and hinder it and even tries to copy it but uh, this kingdom is coming and one day will be seen in its fullness and it will last forever that it will not come to an end forever and ever and God himself will reign and rule. Right now he's allowing many things taking place as we can tell that is not of his character, not of his, of where he's, but he's, he's allowing these things to take place because he's working out his plan, his plan of redemption and his plan of ushering in the kingdom of God. So when you look and you realize that in verse 44, he's consumed all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Verse 45, inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. He was interpreting the dream that Nebuchadnezzar the king had received that there are, there are great kingdoms that are coming and Nebuchadnezzar was the number one gold kingdom. Then the precious metals all of a sudden turn less and less. It goes to silver, the Medo-Persian. Then it would go to the bronze, the, the Grecian. And then it would go to the iron, which has been interpreted as being Rome. And all of these kingdoms shall rise and fall, but in the end, one shall come and stand forever. That's the kingdom of God that will be ushered in. And that's what we're living for, trusting in and knowing that, that he has a, a host and an army. He has a, a kingdom. He has a rulership. He has laws. He has a, a character. He has concerns these, that his kingdom will be established by. And Jesus even said that my kingdom is what? Not of this world. He said even the God of this age, Satan himself said that I could give you what? I can give you, when he was being tested in the wilderness, I can give you the kingdoms of this world. I can give them to you. And Jesus didn't say, oh no, you can't. No, no, that's not in your... He, he didn't come again. He, in other words, the God of this age, they're his. Now he's on the leash of the great creator. But nevertheless, they're his. 
And in this, we're looking and realizing that when he says, in this world has nothing in me and I nothing in this world, and that the kingdoms are in the, the hands of the adversary, then we must realize that when God is ushering in his kingdom, it's not going to be of this world. The kingdom he's bringing is one that this world is now just been experiencing, meaning in the hearts of his people. Currently, his kingdom is hidden. And it's hidden in the vessels of the saints. And currently, his kingdom is hid with him. He says, you are hid with him. He says that his kingdom is in you. And is currently being manifested and brought forth of this world looks upon and says foolishness. When in actuality, the king of all looks upon the world and says foolishness. So, we're looking and realizing that the world does not have the kingdom of God. Rather, the kingdom of God is being put forth, brought forth into those who believe. When you look down over history, now, people love to categorize things. True? Classify. Label. True? That anytime you're dealing with nationalities, immediately classifying. Religions, classifying. Ages, classifying. Even primary school, secondary school, elementary school, high school, college. We have all of these elements. We have, we have uh, blacks, whites, we have Japanese, Ger German. We have all these various classifications. We're always classifying. We're always labeling rich, poor, smart, not, tall, short. We have, right, we're always classifying. And what category do you fit in? And I've told you the story when I, when I got saved and I was talking to my father-in-law. One of his great concerns in talking with me and trying to hear my testimony is he was looking to what I've become. The label. Give me the label. What are you now? And the moment after an hour of witnessing to him, I said that I am now a I had a born-again experience. I'm a born-again Christian. Oh, okay, good. It's like, whew, now we figured it all out. Got the label. Got the category. Got the classification. Now, when you look through this, and there's many, many peoples and many classifications, and you see it all down through age, but in the economy of God, there are many classifications as well as far as people goes and nations, but really it comes down to there's two classifications, there's two categories. When it comes to the kingdom of God, those who believe, those who don't. You have believers and unbelievers. You have people who are in the faith and people who are not. You have the wise and you have the foolish. Now that's not a message really that everybody wants to hear that doesn't have the Lord, right? But yet the Bible makes it clear that if you have the Lord, you're wise. As a matter of fact, it says, he who saves souls is wise. It says, the one who's chasing the riches of this world is foolish. <laughs> you're spending your time in an area that doesn't profit. He's not anti-riches. He's not anti-prosperity. He's not anti-this and anti- He's just saying that if you're going to spend your energies, spend it in something that's got wisdom connected to it, which is saving souls. Seeing people... Promoting the gospel. Coming to the knowledge of God. That's what it's all about. He doesn't go through and, and say that there's all kinds of people. Well, you've got this and you've got that. You've got those who are barely slipping in. You've got the righteous. You've got the unrighteous. You've got the faithful. You've got the unfaithful. You go through all of this. You've got those who sought God. Those who aren't seeking God. You've got all. As a matter of fact, you've got the Bible says the circumcised and the uncircumcised. Now, in the natural, we all understand what circumcision is, I think. So, in this, we recognize and say, oh, the, the, that, the, that means I have to go and get circumcised in order to be... What he's always been and continually talking about through Scripture is not the outward, natural, physical circumcision, but even Isaiah says the circumcision of the heart, which is where everybody goes wrong. And you'll notice that in Old Testament scripture that when they came into a state of brokenness or mourning or humility or something was blasphemy, the priest would tear his clothes, 
rent his clothes to show how off this was and how much he hurts by it. And, and he's making a public declaration of tearing his clothes off. I don't think I'll demonstrate that tonight. That, that, but making a demonstration of it. Well, God, through the prophets, comes to the station of Israel, the state of Israel, and says, don't rent your garments. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in you renting your heart. Open that up. That's what he's after. I'm not after those who are circumcised in the flesh outwardly aren't the people of God. The people of God are the ones who circumcise their heart of that unnecessary flesh. Expose yourself is what it is. Expose yourself. Just as circumcision of a male exposes him, same way, expose yourself and get rid of that flesh that you've been hiding behind. That's what it's all about. And in this, God Almighty has been declaring that there's those who have been circumcised and those who aren't. Another way of saying it is that there's Jew and Gentile. Now this is an important message to grasp because many miss it. And even today are promoting and hoping to restore natural Israel, the natural Jew. Meaning the ones who have been born of Abraham through the natural. And everyone understands what I mean by natural. Right? That, that when you're looking in the natural, carnal, worldly descendants of Abraham, Paul's the one who really makes it clear and says, those aren't, just because you're born of Abraham, of, of the descendants of Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, through those loins, that doesn't make you automatically a person of God. That just because you can claim your lineage, because those are the same ones that put Christ to death. And they said, well, then are we all lost? And Paul says, well, I'm a Jew. I'm saved. I'm born again. But it's not because I was born a Jew, but it's because I, have, I am a Jew in the spirit, meaning I'm a person of God. I'm a people of God. I'm a believer. I'm one of the faith. It's not being born of Isaac in the natural. It's being born of the promise of Abraham who believed God. And in Romans chapter 4, it talks about the circumcision that Abraham did was before the law was even given. But yet it was that he believed God. That's what was accounted him to him a righteousness. So what is God after in our lives? But to bring forth a circumcision of the heart, to rent the garments of the heart, to get to the new man what he's ushering in, his kingdom and his people. So... Many people are seeing it always in the natural rather than realizing that God is doing this all behind the scenes right now, behind the veil of the flesh. So, we're dealing with two kinds of people. The kingdom of God, those who call upon God, those of faith, those of circumcision, those who are renting their garments, those who are righteous, those who have faith, those who are looking for God, those who are believers, those who are wise, Versus the other, other category, which are the foolish, the unbelievers, the ones who don't care about God, who are indifferent, who, who are uh, opposed to God, who are setting up their own rule and aren't concerned with the kingdom of God in any way. There's two classes of people. And even now when you testify and you talk to people about the Lord, you're trying to usher in, you're bringing forth the seed of God, Christ, into their lives that they would also possess Christ or therefore be accepted into the kingdom of God or the family of God under his reign and under his rule because he's the king and we're not. So we let go of our own rulership and we yield to the rulership of Christ. That's what's going on. So he's concerned with this. Throughout the years of creation, time, all of time, there have been God-minded people. All down through the ages, there have been God-minded people, God-minded souls, and there's always been those who are not God-minded. They reject, they defy, they oppose, they deny, they doubt, they ignore, they're indifferent towards, and down through the ages, there's always been, always been, those who called upon and looked for the kingdom of God. In this God is ushering in his kingdom. He's making it known. He's revealing his kingdom. In this, his kingdom is coming. 
His kingdom now already is in the hearts of those who are believers. His kingdom is going to have no end. In the end, there will only be God's kingdom. The Holy Spirit is establishing, revealing the kingdom of God. One of the first things he deals with in your life, my life, or anyone who comes to the Lord is immediately is rulership. You against him. It's true. My way, his way. Immediately it's that Jesus would be your Savior and Lord. Jesus is Savior. Thank God he saved me. And Lord. He's the Lord. We have a harder time in our culture understanding Lord. But when you are living in a Lord type environment, a feudal system, a city state system, a place where there's a, a government or a person that is in total charge of your life, you understand Lord a little better. Whereas here we are having our elections and we're, I like him, I don't like him, and we could talk about this one and we'd vote for that one. I like this and I wish I had the composite of all of them. And we could talk almost, almost freely about who we like, who we don't like, but when you're living in a Lord system, that doesn't happen. When you're living in a Lord system and there's someone above you who you not only bow to, call Lord, but he possesses not only you, but your land and the house you live in, we understand that a little better. And that's not that far-fetched and that, that far ago that you have those kind of systems going on even in Ireland and England and, and you have kings and princes and lords and you have earls. And if you were born into it, you were it. And if you were born in one state, you're not. Well, God Almighty has brought you forth into the family of God. He's the Lord, and he's ushering in his kingdom. And in one of the first places he goes for is, is well, actually, is, is the rulership. Whose rulership? Another area he's going after in his kingdom is relationship. Your relationship with him as father. Your relationship with, to him as Lord. Your relationship to him as your friend. Your relationship to him as, uh, as the king. Your relationship to him as, as the one who is bringing forth uh, the, the helper, the counselor, the guide, the strength, the refuge, the redeemer. And lastly, he's bringing in also his righteousness. So he deals with you in his, in his uh, rulership. And these will be your three struggles. And not just yours, but mine and everyone else you come in contact with that wants anything to do with the Lord. You're always dealing with these three areas. Rulership, relationship, righteousness. Right thinking, right behavior. According to the conduct and the character and the concerns of the Holy Spirit. Do you see how it ties together? Always in regards to the conduct, the character, and the concerns of the Holy Spirit. He's working in rulership. Who's in charge? He's in charge. He's the master. I'm the servant. He's working in relationship. He's the father. I'm the son. He's the savior. I'm the saint. And we're working in righteousness, whereas it's his character, his conduct, and his concerns that become mine. Because the old is gone and the new has come. So his kingdom is being established where he sits on the throne, not us, not self. He's revealing his kingdom. The error of transgression is what we're currently in. Do you remember we talked one time on a Sunday morning about transgression, about stepping over the line? Transgression is stepping across the line. Adam crossed the line. We've been crossing the line ever since. We are living in the error, the time frame of transgression. Everyone transgresses against the character, the conduct, and the concerns of the Holy Spirit. Everyone. But when God ushers in his kingdom, he starts bringing those forth where we are no longer transgressors, but we start walking in the era of triumph. Important to get this. Get that he brings you out of the transgression and he brings you into triumph. He makes you victorious. He sets you free. So you are no longer transgressing and can't help 
but transgress, meaning cross the line and always sinning and can't be anything more than a disobedient person. All of a sudden he starts bringing you out of disobedience and transgression and into freedom and into faithfulness and into believing God where all of a sudden you realize that you are now walking in triumph and not transgression. This is what he's doing in my life, your life, our life, and even what he wants to do in this community. And what is revival or awakening all about is a person opening their eyes to and coming to the understanding, awake to the things of God, the kingdom of God, where they look and they realize, I'm a transgressor, I'm an unbeliever, I'm cut off from, and I need, I want triumph in my life. And they want the kingdom of God, they want the character, conduct, and concerns to come forth in their life. And they start living accordingly. Where the cursing goes, and the, and the, and the taking goes, and they start giving instead. And they, they stop trying to rule everership and, and rule the family. And instead they just start trusting God with their lives. The error of transgression is what we're currently in. Look around, watch the news, watch your own family, watch your neighbors, just watch what everyone's doing, just watch little kids, go to the preschool and you'll see right away, go to the nursery and you'll see right away, transgression is in everyone. It's everywhere. Just watch the news and everyone, you want to have more crime, put laws out there. Right? Because tell everybody to go 55. Tell, it's not going to work. Unless it's in the heart of a person, it's not going to happen. Any type of law, immediately it becomes like the Dennis the Menace, I've got to do it. Right? True? Anybody? Like Dennis the Menace, like the minute he starts playing with his fingers, start, don't tell him, don't touch the button. Don't go out the door. Don't pull down the blind. Don't the, and immediately it's what? I've got to do it. You could probably work the whole day and not have a bite to eat, though you'd be hungry. It wouldn't really bother you. But tell yourself the night before you're going to fast. And you will have hunger pains like you've never had before. Because transgression will work so heavily in you that you don't want to yield to that. It will drive you where I'm eating. I'm sure God will understand. <laughs> All right? But if you just got up and you worked and you were busy and, oh man, I haven't had a chance to eat today. You wouldn't even really just grab a bite to eat and you move on. That's why living together is so easy. Easier. Because no one is making a commitment. No one is making a covenant. No one is coming forth and saying, I am committed to. Covenant speaking. The minute that happens, whoosh, everything in you rises up. But as long as you just say, ah, well, you always got the easy out, and you're never really making that commitment, then it's easier. Now, I have found in Scripture that down through God ushering in His kingdom, bringing forth His uh, uh, revelation, exposing and bringing forth the knowledge of God in people's lives, as we've said, there's been always people who have called upon God. If you look through Scripture, and if you can get these steps, to, it will help you understand God's revelation, this book, tremendously. That God has revealed himself in various times throughout Scripture. And it's been broken down, not necessarily in ages, but in people. God chooses a person and reveals himself and reveals man's weaknesses and reveals his plans. That's why he didn't say from the very beginning it's going to be David. He waited till David and then said in this one. He, he keeps revealing more and more. It's going to be in Bethlehem. It's going to be uh, from a woman. It's going to, he just kept revealing all along the kingdom of God. When you look at your scriptures, you'll first realize that when God revealed the kingdom of God, he first revealed everything through the times of Adam. Matter of fact, if you're taking notes, write these down because it will help you and it will help you to explain the Bible to someone else. God, first of all, revealed his kingdom, his character, his conduct, his concerns, his personhood, his power, his presence in the times of Adam. That's where Genesis 3.15 came with the promises that are from a seed of a woman. That's where you find even in the times of Adam where the, the Sethites, meaning his child Seth, his descendants, it says that they called upon God. 
So it was in the times of Adam. Second of all, as you proceed down through and you start realizing what God is doing, that you start looking at the, at the uh, uh, revelation of his kingdom, the next one is the times of Noah. Now if you look at under the times of Adam, and you can look at all the various events that happened in the times of Adam. If you ever want to explain the Bible really well, capture these times that take place and the various large events that happened in each one, and you'll be able to explain the Bible. You'll understand it that the first it was the times of Adam and God revealed. The next were the times of Noah and God revealed. And notice that in the times of Noah, what was the great event? The flood. And in the flood, God did what? Two things. Two big things. Destroyed and saved. Sounds familiar? And it wasn't, I'm going to save I need a, a black one, a white one, a yellow one, a red one. I need a Episcopalian. I need a Methodist. I need a Baptist. It was, I saved who? Those who were believed and those who didn't? Gone. Perished. Destroyed. How long? Forever. That message has gone forth down through the ages. As a matter of fact, there's a, there's a, no, a, a story of a great flood in almost every culture's history. In almost every culture's, including Hawaii, in their history, there's, a, there's something in their history lessons that goes way back to the myths that, that the, I forget who it is, about Anak or somebody got in a great canoe and they saved some animals. But Everyone's got something about the flood. It really took place. It wasn't an isolated event. And it declared that there's only two kinds of people. Those saved, those not. God's kingdom is all about saving. God's kingdom is all about ushering in his character, his conduct, his concerns. By his presence, by his power, and by his person, Christ Jesus. So, when we look at the times of Noah, we immediately shift and say, well, what's the next times of revelation? Times of Abraham. The times of Abraham when he brought forth the covenant that he made with Abraham. And he revealed more about his kingdom. And he established his plan and said, now this is what, and remember now the great promises that he made to Abraham. And that's when all of a sudden we see it was accounted to him for righteousness. And the sons of Abraham, and the look at the stars, and look at the sands, and all of these great things that took place, and these great events, and these great promises, these great words that were given. I'm going to give you all this. And yet the only thing that Abraham ever owned was a little piece of tomb area for his wife. Because see, Abraham recognized that the promises aren't just for the here and now, but for the ages that are coming. So we look at the times of Abraham and you say, okay, here are the events that took place and remember that great covenant. Next one that we see that, that took place, this great revelation, would be, of course, his son Isaac. The times of Isaac were very short in regards to biblical revelation or great events. Matter of fact, Isaac, you look at his life and you look at all the what the great things that he did. Nothing. Except one great thing. He believed God. He believed God. That's the great thing. Great, great thing. He didn't destroy empires and he didn't build great towers and he wasn't a mighty hunter. And, and as a matter of fact, he's a guy who missed his mom. He's noted as the guy who missed his mother. And when she died and they found him a wife, Rebecca, who ended up bringing forth the next great times of Jacob. The times of Jacob, which are known as the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The patriarchs. So Jacob, the times of Jacob, of which we're looking even now in the men's Bible study in regards to the life of Joseph. But we see the, all the things. But you'll notice that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs, are noted for this great thing. They believed God. And God was bringing forth and revealing his kingdom in these three men. From Jacob, we see the 12 tribes of Israel come forth, meaning his name Jacob was changed to, by God, changed to Israel. And so therefore he had from Rachel, Leah, Bilna, and another one, Zilpah, 
uh, brought forth 12 sons, plus a daughter, Dinah, 12 sons, became known as and evolved into the 12 tribes of Israel. So the 12 tribes of Israel came forth, meaning Reuben and Simeon and Levi and Judah and Gad and Naphtali and Zebulun and all the Dan and all the other ones that came. They became known as the tribes or the 12 tribes from the 12 sons of Israel. Out of those came one named Levi. A son came forth, which was Moses, a son of Levi, of the tribe of Levi, which came from the loins of Jacob, who came from the loins of Isaac, who came from the loins of Abraham. But what was particular about him is that he believed God. So when you look at the times of Moses, so we got the times of Adam, the times of Noah, the times of Abraham, the times of Isaac, the times of Jacob, the times of Moses. Moses is known as the great lawgiver, the one who brought forth the law, the Ten Commandments, where the law was established and the covenant was established, which is known as the Mosaic Covenant, the covenant of Moses, or the Sinai Covenant, meaning it was the covenant made at Mount Sinai, or the covenant of the Ten Commandments. They've even made a great movie of it, right? Everybody's watched the movie. As a matter of fact, many people have grabbed their theology off it. It's easier to watch the movie than read the Bible. So Moses was the great lawgiver that established the covenant of Moses. So we see that taking place. From the days of Moses, we find that from Moses, Moses, my servant, is dead. So who comes next? The times of Joshua. The times of victory. The times of triumph. The time where, where Joshua moves into the land and separates and divides all of the land, the inheritance... See the message? The inheritance of something permanent, land. Sending a message that he divided it among the people of God. Who were the people of God? The 12 tribes of Israel that came from the loins of Jacob, the loins of Isaac, the loins of Abraham. And he divided the land among them. The priest, the Levites, were the ones who did not receive any land, the priest, because they were the ones who the Lord was their inheritance. So in order to have 12 tribes, the tribe of Joseph was not known as the tribe of Joseph, but by his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, or Matt, Manasseh and Ephraim. And you ended up with the 12 tribes, Joseph having two portions. Levi not having any because they were the ones in charge of the tabernacle and teaching the people and being the presence of God and the mediator between people and, and uh, God. And what's the Bible say? You are a royal priesthood. Your inheritance is therefore who? God himself. And you are to stand as a mediator between God and man. Does not what it says is that, that you are ambassadors of Christ declaring and recon the message of reconciliation, peace with God. So we've got the message of Moses coming forth, the kingdom of God being ushered in, the revelation. Notice the revelation going more and more. And more God is revealing and more he's revealing his character, conduct, and concerns. And the more he's revealing who he is, the more that everyone's realizing what they are. You notice that when God steps in and you draw closer to him, more of you shows up. And he basically always has one message for it. It's got to go, right? He doesn't try to deal with it like, all right, here's my deal, deal or no deal. He's not coming in trying to, come, to make a compromise. All right, uh, well, you know, uh, I'm tr I'll be willing to give up this if you're willing to give up that. He doesn't do that. It's this way and only this way. So he's revealed now Joshua, the times of Joshua, the great commander, the great conqueror. From the times of Joshua, we end up with the times of Judges. The times of Judges, where we see two words constantly played out. Did evil, cried out. If you look at the cycle of the Judges, you'll see constantly did evil, they forsake God and go their own way and serve everything else, not God, till God gives them over to what they've been serving. They get so oppressed by those, they turn to God and do what? Cry out. What are they crying out for? A judge. Someone to come and deliver them. Someone to come and rightly judge the things of God in their environment and say, this is the way, go this way, and you'll find freedom. The times of the judges. Up until the times of Samuel, who was the last judge, 
God now ushers in a new era. The people call for a God. And we see now the times of the kings. Saul, David, Solomon. And then something happens in the time of Solomon where in the times of the kings, which is the longest period of time, in the times of the kings, the kings of Israel, in this long period of time of ushering in his kingdom, in this period of time, the time of the kings, you have Saul, who is rejected, you have David, who is elected, and you have Solomon, who inherits the promises of David, but he ends up faltering. And in this, God comes with judgment and tears the kingdom in two. He takes ten tribes from him and gives them to another. Jeroboam. And in this you now have two kingdoms within the tribes of Israel. The northern tribes and the southern tribes. The northern tribes known as Israel. The southern tribes known as Judah. Is this going okay for you? The northern tribes known as Israel. The southern tribes known as Judah. They become basically a split people. You have the southern tribe Judah serving the Lord for the most part, and the northern tribes of Israel, ten tribes that are totally apostate the whole time. Who establish their own place of worship, who establish their own ways, who build the calf and start worshiping the calf and saying, this is the one that brought you out of Israel, out of Egypt, and they just go totally apostate. They are taken over by Assyria in 722 B.C where the Assyrians come in and according to the word of the Lord by the prophets tells them it's going to take place and even in this they don't believe. They are totally taken over and the ten tribes that were there are displaced. Assyria takes them and puts them in other lands and takes other conquered peoples and puts them in that northern area and the, that's where you get the ten lost tribes of Israel whereas they are displaced and this is where you end up with the Samaritans, a mixed hybrid of people that were the ones that they brought in conquered peoples from other lands and they intermingled in order to try to destroy the, the very fabric or, and genealogy of the Jews, of the, of the Israelites. The southern kingdom of Judah slash Benjamin, in that they lasted a little longer because they had some godly kings such as Jehoshaphat and Josiah and a few others, Hezekiah. They lasted longer and they were overtaken by Babylon in 586 BC. Babylon came in and totally destroyed it. These were the times of the kings. The book of Daniel, which we referred to earlier, is the one who said, O Nebuchadnezzar, God has established you to be the conqueror and king of all the world. You're the head of gold. You're the premier. God has given everything under your feet. Babylon does come in and destroys them. This is the time where all the prophets are speaking. Jeremiah is, is speaking in Israel and Judah. Ezekiel is speaking in the conquered land. Daniel is in the courts speaking. And everyone's revealing what? The kingdom of God. Everyone's revealing the character and conduct and concerns of the Lord. These are the times of, of the kings of Israel. But since that time, since that time, please hear me now. Since the days of Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, 586 B.C., no longer is he king. Destroyed. It said that Israel will be what? Trampled over. Trampled over. It's now the era of the Gentile kings. The era of the Gentile kings has been ushered in. Waiting for the final king to come, Christ Jesus himself. Is this making sense? It's all about the kingdom. Everything's about the kingdom. And you're talking about the kingdom, you're always talking about authority. You're always talking about submission. You're always talking about obedience. And so in this, you've got the time of the kings of Israel... They end up being a unified nation with, with Saul, David, and Solomon. But because of Solomon's apostate behavior, they end up, God splits the kingdom, tells Solomon it's going to happen. Ten tribes go to Jeroboam the first, and the other two tribes go to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. And then they end up with kings down through the ages. The northern tribe ends at 722 B.C., 
The Judah tribe ends at 586 BC. Nebuchadnezzar comes in with the king of, kingdom of Babylon and wipes out and destroys and brings everything into subjection. He takes care of Assyria. He takes care of Israel. He takes care of Judah. He takes care of Egypt. Everyone is brought under him. Everyone. Any of the known world, all the tribes are all taken in under his feet just as the Lord had said. He is the king and he is the kingdom of rulership. The time of the Gentiles, meaning those who are, aren't of, of, the, of the Israeli lineage, lineage, Gentiles, outside of the covenants of God, God has given, over, given them over and says, you will be spread to the ends of the earth. You'll be sold for a nickel, basically. To the ends of the earth. You'll be going, brought down to Egypt. You'll be put on the auction block and no one will buy you for your disobedience. The wrath of God is coming over you. I'll be angry with you and my wrath will come against you and I've given all of rulership over to the Gentiles. From, Nebu from Babylon, they are ushered in, take over, but they don't last. Who's the next one to come up but Persia? And Persia comes and rises to power and they take over now. And this is where you end up with Darius. And Darius is the one who, and Cyrus, and Cyrus and Darius are the ones who release the Jews to go back and rebuild their temple and become a people again, but they never have their own king again. They're a conquered people, a captive people, who are now back in their land building the temple. And it says when they built the altar and they built the temple, people were doing two things. One were crying out, thanking God, so, so thankful and joyful for all that God has done, and others who remembered what the old one looked like, Solomon's temple, were weeping and crying. And you couldn't tell the difference between them. The Bible makes that clear. But there are conquered people back in their land. In this, Ezra goes back and teaches the law. And over a period of time, you end up with prophets speaking to them. And in this, the Pharisees are the ones who surface. The Sadducees are the ones who surface. Pharisees were ones who were zealous for the law and the traditions of men. In this Gentile rulership, the Persians falter. And in this also now the Grecian uh, the Greeks rise to power and they make everything Greek. It's called Hellenization. Everything is turned into Grecian language, Grecian culture, Grecian statues. If you're going to do anything in the kingdom, it was going to be Greek. If you're going to sell anything, it was going to be Greek. As a matter of fact, Paul himself even said that, that, that Greek-speaking Jews, Hellenized Jews, Ones who were Jew by birth, but spoke and were, were made Grecian. Even when the Roman Empire rises up and takes over all of Greece, they keep all of the gods of Greece, they, they make them, they give them their own names, and they're basically now known as the Greco-Roman Empire. You probably learned that in history. So this is what's taken place, and all of a sudden Malachi gives his message, the last prophet of the, of the Bible in the Old Testament. Malachi gives a message saying, will you rob God? See, they had turned apostate again. He's talking to the Jews that are back in the land and building the temple and building their own homes. And all of a sudden he says, he goes, but one is coming. One is coming. Same one Daniel talked about. All of a sudden you have basically 400 silent years. Think of it now. How old is our country? Since 1776? Think now, 400 years pass. Not a word comes forth from the mouth of any prophet. Not a word comes forth. No new revelation. All of this has taken place. The time of the Gentiles has been ushered in. And nothing is happening. And the last words from Malachi is chapter 4. For behold, the day is coming burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day that I, that I do this, says the Lord of hosts, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet 
before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And then silence. 400 years. 400 years. Silence. And all of a sudden, think of it now, and all of a sudden, one who's eating locusts and wearing camel, living in the desert, comes and says, Repent. Repent. For the coming of the Lord. The kingdom of God is here. I tell you, the kingdom of God is here. Repent. 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 I baptize you in the name of the Lord. There's one who's coming that I am not able to even, I'm not, I can't even untie his sandal strap. And he's baptizing them and he's declaring, turn from your wicked ways. After 400 years of nothing, he comes in with this message. And what does Jesus say about him? For those who believe, he is Elijah. He is Elijah. For those who believe, he is the spirit of Elijah. And we're now all of a sudden seeing the times of the Holy Spirit being ushered in. The times of Christ on this earth. The times of the Holy Spirit and the church age being ushered, ushered in. The times where you find all of a sudden everyone that, that God is doing something. And he, he, everybody's expecting him. Everyone was expecting him to come with absolute rule. Is this the time where you're going you're gonna to set up your kingdom? Is this the time where you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Remember, and even when, when Jesus is resurrected and he's about to ascend to the Father, what do they ask him? When's the kingdom? The kingdom. The kingdom. They're looking for the kingdom. The book of Acts ends with Paul doing what? Preaching the kingdom. Jesus kept talking in the book of Matthew about what? The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. I'll tell you what the kingdom of God is like. I'll tell you what the kingdom of heaven is like. Ushering in what? The kingdom. And the, John the Baptist was declaring, repent, repent, for the day of the Lord has come. The kingdom of God is here. And all of a sudden, he starts, here comes Jesus. And he says, what? Here he is. This is he who I've been telling you about. This is he who was prophesied above down through the ages. This is the one that goes back to Genesis 3.15, the seed of a woman. This is him. This is not just him, meaning born of Mary. This is him, meaning what? The child, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. The kingdom is in him. We must follow him. I must decrease. He must increase. He's it. And what is it all about? But kingdom rulership. The kingdom of the ages that have come. And it's not just what's happened. We're not done with this yet. Think of it now. We're in the age right now which is called basically the church age. Where the Holy Spirit is doing a work in the church, meaning you and I. God is right now in the midst of calling forth His people. The word there is ecclesia. His church. I will build my church. Ek. E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A, ecclesia. That Greek word means to be called out into the assembly. To be called out. To, be, to come out into, from, the peop, from where you've been and come into the place where God is establishing an assembly. He's establishing his church, his ecclesia, his called out ones. And even this in us, this isn't it. Even you and I, there's still more to go. The kingdom of God is still coming, whereas all of a sudden when, when Christ blows that, when that trumpet is blown and he comes back for his saints and we're lifted in the Lord and meet him in the air. Think of it that it's still not over. We're with him, marriage supper of the Lamb, and we're with God now and forevermore. And all of a sudden we realize what? The tribulation is still coming. And then all of a sudden realize what? That he's going to come back with all his saints and he's going to be ushering in his kingdom. And the millennial age of Christ, 1,000 years of where God rules on this earth with absolute a rod of iron, it says. A rulership where the lion will lay down with the lamb. All wickedness will be done away with. There'll be no crying, no sorrow, where everyone will be at peace. Where everyone has been put in the lake in the fire except for one. The devil himself who's been chained in the pit, waiting for his next time to come out. This millennial age is going to take place. And even this, after 1,000 years, now what takes place? He lets out Satan, the great adversary, the red dragon, the dragon comes forth and deceives the nations and they all come against him again. The great deceiver deceives. People will follow after him, the great falling away. But even in this, people will believe. 
And all of a sudden, at the end of this, when God all of a sudden says, that's it, how much time that is, we do not know. But all of a sudden, that's it. He puts an end to it. They throw Satan and all of his cohorts and all of his followers into the lake of fire that was prepared for him from long ago. And he comes in now, and it's still not over. Now he comes in with the kingdom. What's he doing? He's now going to set up his new heaven and his new earth and his new Jerusalem that he's been preparing. And it comes forth and, he set, and the old earth is passed away and the new earth, is, the new heavens and the new Jerusalem are all established. We're just in this, and this is your peace and my peace. How many years are we here? This little sliver in comparison to all that God has been doing, is doing, and will be doing. And it's still not over. The Bible says this one thing, for the ages to come. What's that mean? It doesn't tell us. For the ages to come. Think of it. And here you and I are worried about sometimes, like, uh, you know, gee, how am I going to pay that mortgage? Or how am I going to get that tank of gas? Or, gee, i got a hangnail that's really bothering me. And, like, you know, and, right? And we get a lot of valid things, but then think about it, that we get all bothered, depressed, or what's God doing in my, how come he can't? And when you look at the great panoramic picture that he has for us, think about the ages to come where he sets up new Jerusalem, new heaven, new earth. And it says even at the end of Revelation, the spirit and the bride say, come. We get the same message. The bride is going to be one with the spirit saying what? Welcome, come. Where? Into the kingdom of God. What's our message? That the kingdom of God is what counts. The kingdom of God is the only thing that matters. And God is doing this great work. When you look at your Bible, you'll see it broken down into the times of Adam. You'll see it broken down into the times of Noah. You'll see it broken down into the times of, of Abraham, into the times of Isaac, and the times of Jacob. And then you'll see it broken down into the times of Moses, and the times of, uh, of uh, Joshua, and the times of Judges, and the times of kings, and the times of the divided kingdom, and the time of the Gentiles, and the time of the church, and the time of the tribulation, and the time of the millennial age, and the time of God's rulership. And now all of a sudden you realize, and you say, and the ages to come. They're not there. Not there. That's all it says. And the ages to come. Paul, even at the end, what is he saying? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God the kingdom of God, and no one stopped him from preaching the kingdom of God. And just in case you think it's just all about us, remember that there were always in the Old Testament, there were primeval saints, those that were in the old world before Noah, before the flood, those who believed God, those who called upon God, all those Sethites who called upon God. Just in case you think it's just about us, there were all of those saints, Old Testament saints, that believed upon God, like Jeremiah, like Isaiah, like David, like all the ones of all the old that called upon God, believed God, followed God, all of the ones who followed God, and all of those are waiting for perfection, just as you and I are waiting for perfection, that they're not going to be perfected before we are, we're not going to be perfected before they are, that all of us will be happening at once. Hebrews makes that clear. And just in case you think it's just only about us, remember the church age for the past 2,000 years, plus of all that God has been doing, and saving and all the people everywhere and all the children that have believed upon God and all the people on their dying beds who have believed upon God and all the things that have taken place and just in case you think that's just it remember the tribulation saints where all of them are going to be calling upon God and whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved and just in case you think it's just about them remember that there's the millennial saints that all of a sudden are going to also be following God and looking for God and seeking God and you've got all of those saints and just you think it's just all about us remember the angels the elect angels and remember the living creatures and remember all of the things that are going on in the heavens that you and I don't see, I tell you, we're going to be one big family. Amen. And when we get together and worship the Lord, remember, boy, this is going to be some humdinger of a service. And there'll be no more crying there. No more, oh, I blew it again. Oh, Lord, help me. Oh, gee, I could just, if I could just see, oh, I pray for my son. I pray for my daughter. I pray for my neighbor. Oh, there's going to be just this huge, 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 enormous, humongous, panoramic sea of, of different people. And you don't even know what we're going to look like yet. The Bible says we don't even know what we're going to look like yet. Try to describe yourself. Well, I'm going to have a little nose. And they're like, we have no other way of knowing. No, you don't know what you're going to look like. You know? Like my hair a little longer, a little shorter, like that. Lose a little hair like that. You know? <laughs> you don't know what you're going to look like. All you know is this you're going to look just like him. You're going to be just like him.
That's what it says. Doesn't give us any more. As a matter of fact, if he told us, you probably would go, oh my Lord, what is that? <laughs> you know? If I showed you a, a, a seed of corn, and just a seed of corn, and you've never seen what a seed of corn can turn into. Never saw it. Just showed you a seed of corn. It says, do you have any idea what that could become? Say, no, describe it for me. Tall, green, higher than you, leaves going this way and that way, out of that thing. Yeah, matter of fact, it's going to be all of a sudden have this huge thing on it with a bunch of those on it. <laughs> Deep roots everywhere. What are you talking about? Roots. What do you mean, roots? What are you talking about? I don't understand. It's going this way, that way. You mean... That one thing you talk about, what do we call that? We'll call it a stock. We'll call that an ear. I got no ears. What are you talking about, ear? Oh, not only that, listen now. Not only that, but a whole field of it. See, you saw just the one. Not just a field of it, but enough in the one to feed nations. Think about what God has got planned. There's not just the seed of corn. The seed of corn is enough not only to grow the stock, but there's enough to have a field. There's enough to cover Nebraska. There's enough power. There's enough change in that one kernel to feed the world. That's God's plan for you. All we have to do is, I believe. That's it. I believe. Don't short circuit and don't bring shortcoming into what God has planned. Don't believe everything you're seeing. Believe what you're reading. The ages to come go far beyond what you're seeing. Don't cut God's arm short. Do this one thing. I believed, therefore I spoke. In Jesus' name. Amen? Stand before the King. Truly, stand before the King.